but wait a minute, mother is an asset. She's not a lethal threat to her yeah. baby apparently. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. And uh, so this should be seen as adaptation that has to be made dangerous. It doesn't begin dangerous. It mm -hmm. must be made dangerous as a big distinction. That is the, a great way to look at it. Yeah. In, in what's been perpetuated. Yeah. Introducing Breast Sleeping, a new understanding of humanity's time-honored sleeping and feeding arrangement. Safe Infant Sleep, expert answers to your co-sleeping questions. Welcome to the Gentle Finds podcast. I am so excited to introduce you today to Dr. James McKenna, who is the leading expert on mother-infant sleep in the United States. He founded and directed the Mother Baby Behavioral Sleep Laboratory at the University of Notre Dame, the first of its kind to study the physiology and behavior of co-sleeping parents and infants. And he has appeared on NBC, CNN, ABC, The Today Show, and NPR, and is a global voice on the relationship between bed sharing, breastfeeding, and sleep. Hi, Jim. Hey there, Lindsay. Good to be with you today. Yes. So um, how about we start with how you came into this? I actually uh, was interested in studying the social behavior of monkeys and apes in relationship to things potentially we could learn about human primates. And I actually got my tenure at Pomona College basically writing articles about mothering behavior, and the ecology of parenting among non-human primates, uh, which had implications for in interpreting human evolution and various aspects of humankind. It's hard to make sometimes that comparison, granted, but there are times where looking at non-human primates as a society more objectively, you can actually be alerted to things that might actually be related in human societies and human behavior that you wouldn't perhaps think of, given we're kind of so close to <laughs> the creatures, which is us. So my transition, quite shockingly, was after the birth of our first child, Jeffrey. And as things go, there was a great, wonderful, unexpected integration of what I was experiencing personal with what I had come to learn in mm. anthropology, which was both cross-cultural, ethnographic, uh, you know, information about how other cultures live and how humans live in general around the world, plus this biological anthropology knowledge of both the uh, trajectory of human evolution, what distinguishes us, why we behave as we do, mm -hmm. and non-human primate infants have very prolonged childhoods, as I mentioned. So they start out relatively immature neurologically, uh, relatively speaking, like 60% of their brains are developed. Um, when uh, my infant son was born, I'll get back to this point about neurological immaturity in a minute. Uh, like all parents, Joanne and I ran to the bookstores to see how to be the perfect parent. What are we going to do with yeah. this lovely little child? And, you know, what really we both came to realize, because my wife Joanne is an uh, anthropologist too, an archaeologist, but you learn a foundation piece of all disciplines before you specialize. Mm -hmm. um, we realized that either everything that we had learned in anthropology was incorrect, especially in my own work on the physiological effects of separation of the mother infant. Uh, situation or relationship to, to circumvent that. Um, we thought that almost everything had to be wrong or nothing about what we were reading about how best to care for human babies had anything to do with babies at all and everything to do with very recent cultural ideologies of how you should raise a baby and what you should do with them. Mm -hmm. And indeed, it's true. All those early century the last century recommendations had really nothing to do with babies it was basically sort of strangely white four white guys that probably never changed a diaper <laughs> sitting in seats integrating not knowingly a cultural view of who babies should be 
rather than who they are and what to do with them to get the all American in our case, in our culture, individualist, secure, confident little baby. And that so was interesting. Be, yeah. You know, get them in another room as soon as you can get them yeah. sleeping through the night. That's, you know, we got to toughen them up kind they of. They should thing. have a job at seven months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And they're independent at four months, you know, yeah. and we want the independence, you know, that little meme or idea um, is not actually what parents want. It's what they worry about, but it's not mm -hmm. what they want. They don't want their 16 year old to say, Hey, mom and dad, thanks a lot for the independence. I'll see you later. I'm going right. off with my peers. now." You know, it, it, we want familialism. Yeah. We, we want to sustain interdependence. We love each other. We want to be part of each other's life. Yeah. So it's very odd that at four to six to eight to 12 months, we're thinking about, oh my God, how do we get this baby independent? You know, it's yeah. ridiculous if, if you really think about it. So anyway, so, I got into the field yeah. because I had been sensitized to how among infant primates born with much larger brains, how long it takes for their physiological systems to mature. Mm -hmm. And that, that maturity takes place within the microenvironment of all the sensory exchanges of touch and smells and, and breastfeeding and movement that isn't just nice, it is and becomes part of that baby's physiology. And here, in our case, is a baby born with 25% of its brain volume, extremely neurologically immature. For the most part, all of us compared with the other mammals are born pre as preemies. We're yeah. all premature babies. The 75% of the ner central nervous system developing after the infant is born. That suggests a huge role that the actual carrying and holding and the type of nutrition that you select and what the nutrition requires yeah. Breastfeeding isn't just breast milk, it's the delivery. And so I was all ready for that. And especially this was the really final uh, observation. Uh, I was really a primary caregiver with my wife um, and she was exclusively breastfeeding, but we both immediately responded to our baby. Nobody was, mm -hmm. you know, the one to do anything yeah. except breastfeeding, which I couldn't do. You're a good husband. I, well, <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just a weird person in that sense. I, <laughs> I, I fall in love with everybody really quickly. So yeah. anyway, um, what I was saying is that I noticed that when I was holding him, even at two weeks, he was aware of how I was breathing. And if I speed, I sped up my breathing, he would change his breathing in mm. relationship to mine. And I started, it was first just an interesting observation, you know, as yeah. a father. And I didn't take it any further. I just said, wow, I can slow down. I can breathe hard. I can breathe smooth. And he is noticing it. And when I say that, it's not that he's cognitively noticing it. Yeah. His body is noticing it. And it's responding reflexively. Yeah. Mirroring your physical thought, movement. Wow, yeah, yeah, that's right feeling my breath, perhaps, breathing mm -hmm. my carbon dioxide, and it's hitting his phrenic nerve and driving his, his uh, diaphragm to, to breathe in some way different. And I thought that incredibly interesting. Mm -hmm. And then when I really had a chance to think about this in the context of my research, I said, Jim, in the world are you surprised about? You've read about, you've written about how critical contact is for the development of the non-human primates brain. Yeah. So you think suddenly that the 25% brained primate, <laughs> our, our little go. baby born yeah. with 25, that this is not significant to them in a very physical way. And so it led me to believe, I'm shortening the tail here a little bit, um, that maybe the Western uh, phenomenon only known in Western industrialized society of sudden infant death syndrome had some relationship to the to prematurely putting our premature babies in the generic sense uh, apart from us and mm -hmm. missing the actual physical regulation and streams of sensory engagements that actually tie into the baby's physiology. It's almost as if you're saying to consider 
newborns that are healthy newborns, we don't call them premature babies, but in your sense of it, it sounds like you're still considering them premature. And when you have a baby, I remember when I had my baby, um, what became significant to me was the idea that she was in her fourth trimester because everything that I did that worked was to imitate what I could of the womb. Right. So that was that, some good thinking, Lindsay, actually, well, because I that's had to. what the babies need, that the yeah. breast becomes the new umbilical cord. Right. And the delivery of it is still uh, your body. And mm -hmm. as I like to say, that the habitat of the human infant is in fact only the mother's body. Everything a baby can do or cannot do is explicable by the adaptation of the baby systems to what the mother's body and her behavior and care extends to that baby. That's a very hard thing for, I think, Western scientists to really deal with. And then thus, when they think of a baby, they think all you need to do is look at the baby mm -hmm. and look at its eyesight, look at its digestion, look at its breathing system. Yeah. So um, I have tried to argue through many years that it is not the infant the subject of physiological study. It has to be the microhabitat within which that baby lives and on which the baby depends for survival. And that is another human body, which is primarily the mother because mm -hmm. of the role of breastfeeding, but it isn't exclusively the mother, that other bodies in touch and contact, the dad's body is critical too and can offer the same regulatory uh, changes or engagements which the baby's body genomically genetically expects to experience yeah and you know Lindsay you can go around the world and take every newborn baby no matter how exotically different um, the babies may look or be dressed or be painted by their mothers or fathers put those babies on a mother's ventrum and every single baby in the world will do the same thing and that is telling us that the genomes of the human baby are, of course, similar. They're mm -hmm. not culturalized. They don't know what to expect. They're not worrying about getting into college. They're right. like a little genetic machine. Their genes are speaking loudly and clearly. Baby's not thinking what they want. They have not. They only have needs. And their bodies are expressing those needs through reflexes and the behavior of the baby, which the only weapon the baby has to um, communicate that it's something is wrong is crying. Mm -hmm. And what I think we, we often do is sort of victimize babies for being babies. They're not trying to manipulate. Yes. They're not capable of manipulating. They're really honestly expressing to their caregivers that they don't know what it is, perhaps, uh, in any intellectual sense, but they, their genes feel what's missing and mm -hmm. that they cry when they, and protest sleep isolation. Now, protest is really the wrong word because that confers some idea of knowledge that they're, they're doing it to get what they want or need. Um, but again, I used the word want and I shouldn't have because what that is expressing is in fact a genetic need. And mm -hmm. eventually, of course, they transition into cognition of putting together cause and effect yeah. and identifications of specific others, you know, um, that comes, you know, after about six months. You know, at first, you know, babies can be handled. You know, I used to teach a course in, uh, in well, I still do, infancy. And uh, I would have all the uh, kind of local Leche League moms to come in with their babies, you know, infants. And my class, from the minute they would see the babies, and we'd been talking about babies for maybe four weeks, you know, defining mm -hmm. who they are. And, such. and when we would, when they would look at the babies, my class would, they'd act like they had never seen one before, because a lot of the abstract things we were learning suddenly were going to be here. Yeah. And mothers were breastfeeding their babies in front of, and it was like a culture shock to actually take the knowledge we had been learning and looking at the babies doing what we were talking about and all these babies were relatively young i wanted them to see maybe not older than seven or eight months yeah and those babies like toys could be passed along the class members and they were happy just looking around 
And well, I didn't do it. The second exercise like that would have been to take some 16 month olds or 20 month old and watch the differences. Take them the through the stages. No way. Yeah. Because <laughs> they're attached and they know a little about the world. They want, they want their mothers yes. or their fathers or your caregivers and in their best interest. They are now saying, well, wait a minute. I don't know you. Right. Uh, I want who to help. And want, yeah, want. Now they do yeah. want that and they know yeah, they want uh, it. They're able to control their cry, which they couldn't do for a month or two in the mm. first part of life. And then and even after they didn't associate want in the sense of, oh, wait a minute, I know something else is better. I want my mom. I'm going right. to get her by crying. You know, <laughs> that, that, that's just not what babies do. Um, but there's um, a lot of left, leftover Calvinist religions um, that actually began with the notion that the baby was kind of baby was kind of ruthless and needed to be kind of put into the context of knowing their parent was the boss. Mm -hmm. And I think oh notions, that exists today still in other yeah, forms, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. The, the baby needs to be cleansed, mm -hmm. and we talk even about original sin in many religions. And think about that in less of an abstract, but how that plays out perhaps in the way parents think they have to assert, you know, a kind of a control that uh, they, they have to assert care. But I don't think it should be viewed as, you know, that the baby is a potential adversary. And, right. Um, they don't. I mean, they're, they're really honest about what they actually need. Hmm. And it's not a form of manipulation. Yeah. So I'll let you ask me something. Oh, you... well, I just had some introductory questions. So um, in the book, you say you don't want to tell people what's right for them. And you acknowledge that there isn't necessarily a one size fits all model uh, with our current way of living. And I think that's just an important place to start. Um, just by letting the audience know that we're providing this information, uh, that you've studied the uh, the benefits uh, and find this to be the most beneficial way, but that there's an understanding that all families are different. Uh, right. Yeah. What I what I argue is that I don't want to judge or um, assume that, as you're saying, that everyone can safely sleep with their baby. I think what's critical is, which was never done in the initial recommendations to a large degree, it still isn't done, is to ask first before you do anything about mm -hmm. recommending what you should do or what would be optimal to maybe a better way to put it. I don't like the word use of the word should, is to know who it is you're talking about. If you're going to make recommendations, you have to first know, all right, what's normative? Biologically speaking for a human infant, who is the human infant? That was the question never asked and isn't still asked in spheres of knowledge in our culture by med medical people are not taught anything about really the evolution of parenting and infancy. I mean, how could they be? They have, they're stuffed with things that are required, et cetera. But so as I, I've always argued that that point, who they are, never was answered. Now, we're in a position to be able to know now and, and answer the question. It doesn't tell us what to do with that knowledge or how the knowledge can be fit into an urban industrial society because it isn't the context actually uh, within which our, all of our human attributes, adult and infant, evolved. Mm -hmm. um, so all of us for 99% of our existence as a species, we're all around the world, hunters and gatherers living in close concert with the environment and, and our fears, our hopes, our, our humanness is best explained by thinking, at least initially, about it. But it doesn't do much when you see how culture is advanced and we live in these remarkable technologically based, many, many of us, not everyone, technologically based, industrialized, often societies. So you can really begin to look for kind of mismatches between what our bodies expect or what might actually be more optimal and what the culture provides. Mm -hmm. Our ability to create artificial organs that do what our own organs can't do uh, to keep us warm in minus 20 degrees or you know, to you know, provide a reliable food source um, and everything that uh, you know, modern tool using uh, and dependent on tools 
permits us to do that other species can't. We, we in, with our primate bodies, which are tropical design bodies for the tropics, we're able to live anywhere in the world. We can colonize anywhere by way of uh, kind of a extra somatic outside the body adaptations, tools, mm. um, clothes, fire, heat, you know, yeah. uh, defensive weapons. Uh, you know, we, we, our own organs can't do it, but we can extend the function of those organs um, and tying them together with objects we make mm -hmm. and create that, that will permit us to inhabit this incredible range of different environments. And that's pretty darn good. And we depend on language. We evolved a brain that permits us to use symbols to represent the reality out there and even the irreality, the non-reality, our imaginations and our, our fiction, you know, our stories, whatever. It's all tied together. Um, and so sometimes that can go astray. You can get culture going in a direction on beliefs and, and ideologies that really leave behind what is in fact more optimal. And certainly this is the major problem with Western ideas of the best care of babies, separation mm -hmm. um, and isolation and the presumption that you can get contribute to babies becoming who we want them to by just simply following the cultural rules. Um, which are never sleep with your baby. Oh, breastfeeding. Oh, yeah, that's that's just a choice, you know. Um, yeah. And now it's much less that I'll say for breastfeeding. But go ahead, yeah. Lindsay. You wanted to say um, something. Just so you you've also created this term breast sleeping that you introduce right. in the the book Safe Infant Sleep, um, and you studied co sleeping bed sharing breast sleeping now is what you're recommending can you can you describe these terms and give us an idea of what you mean co-sleeping is not a radical concept and and i have just accepted the fact that people are going to continuously use it in different ways but i was uh thinking about what co-sleeping actually is mm -hmm. and it's a generic concept it's used in many different ways um, and it's unfortunate because, um, for example, dangerous bed sharing, which none of us would recommend, would be one form of co-sleeping that would not be recommended. But what the term I use is breast sleeping to suggest that there are important distinctions to be made, especially in the context in which I've defined this term, which refers to the uh, breastfeeding mother who bed shares, mm -hmm. which is what we do in our industrialized Western country, it, absent of all the hazardous factors that we know exist, which would be smoking, drugs, alcohol, putting babies prone, other children in the bed, uh, face down sleeping on pillows or back sleeping on pillows, um, and you know, perhaps um, unfortunately sleeping with or at least in the same bed with. Um, premature babies, which they're very fragile and they don't have the protective, the abilities often to protect themselves from, you know, obstruction of their air passages and all. But um, in any event, so breast sleeping is very different. It changes everything about what the mother does, where she puts the baby, how she responds to the baby, how sensitive she is to the baby, and the baby likewise. Um, so the reason that it isn't often useful to just use co-sleeping as a generic pattern proximity and the ability to signal each other mm -hmm. mother and baby etc is because you're not distinguishing uh, the circumstances within which that co-sleeping could be dangerous like couch sleeping sofa sleeping sleeping on recliners sleeping in a chair that's co-sleeping but it's dangerous mm -hmm. and so you don't want to like other kinds of issues we're talking about in society. You don't want to just um, think of it as um, a, a coherent, uh, homogenous behavior when it can take so many forms. One form being life-saving, another form being potentially lethal. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the debate about bed sharing is all about. 
um, that in many ways, at least in terms of the present, medical authorities have responded to a very tiny fraction of babies in our culture, in our society. And they have defined um, co-sleeping in the form of bed sharing in particularly, but sometimes just co-sleeping in terms of always being too dangerous to do. And that's just not true. Mm -hmm. um, if that was true, none of us would actually be here today because right. co-sleeping has had incredibly diverse human forms. Uh, so it's not unusual today mm -hmm. in our urban industrial life that yet again, we have kind of a different form of, of bed sharing that we call, we use beds and mattresses and box springs and have headboards. So we have, we do have a range of things we have to be on guard about. Mm. We know that co-sleeping in the form of simple proximity, sleeping on the same surface is inherently adaptive, inherently beneficial but it can be made dangerous. Mm -hmm. But those are modifiable factors. And it's what the American Academy of Pediatrics has been unwilling to uh, admit to be important yeah, in the that's... that mothers make. And so that's what I've been arguing against. I presented and my colleagues have, Helen Ball, Sally Baddox, Australia. Um, let's see, am I forgetting Janine Young? Um, so Sally's in... New Zealand and, and Janine Young is in Australia. But there are studies that really confirm the beneficial physiological changes that babies experience when breastfeeding and sleeping, of course, in context with in proximity to their mothers, whether on the same surface or not. I should insert here that as I, as I say that distinction should be made, I should also say that a very beneficial way to co-sleep is to have the baby right next to your bed in a bassinet in some kind of co-sleeping structure mm -hmm. uh, within sensory range. Again, yeah. so that moms can be vigilant, respond to the baby, and the baby can respond to the presence of the mother. And in your book, you actually give recommendations for co-sleeping bassinets. Would you say that that does, that's nearly breast sleeping? Yeah, right? absolutely. In yeah. fact, it can be breast sleeping. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, it's it, when you're stuck with absolute terms, it's really mm -hmm. hard to, to recognize that life is messy. Right. <laughs> you, you get, in reality, you get, you never get one breast sleeping situation that will be the same as another. Yeah. Because you can't account for how much it means for, to a mother. We're all how different. Yeah. That even that is different and where she lives and, external dangers and internal dangers, some of which you can't do anything about. Um, some of the, the parts of the book that I found really interesting were the descriptions of the physiology of the infant body. Uh, there were things that I didn't know even after having a baby. Uh, and you refer to humans as a carrying species. What right, right. does that mean? Carrying species is we never, the species, and around the world rather than industrialized societies, babies go wherever the parent goes, wherever mm -hmm. the mother goes, and her ala mothers, individuals other than the mother that will hold the baby, carry the mother, and assist in caregiving. That's been our human claim to fame. Yeah. And no baby. Oh, sorry. Go what, no, what, what hit me was when you mentioned that primates and monkeys actually have brains that are more developed than ours when they're born and they're able to cling to their mothers. And I remember, I don't know how old she was. It was, um, you know, a little while after she was born before my daughter was able to finally hold on to me. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so it's dependent on the mother or a caretaker uh, really being there. Yes. Yeah, so that's a very important distinction that reflects the fact that the brain is not developed for motor control in the sense that monkeys and apes are. And that was because of when we began to evolve bipedalism or upright posture at the very same time that to accommodate tool using and making that is def defining of humans, even the fetal brain was getting bigger and bigger while the pelvic outlet to accommodate upright walking was getting smaller and smaller. So in a sense, natural selection had to work on favoring brains that were smaller and smaller through time 
Mm -hmm. because of the tremendous advantages of incorporating tools and getting the brains to be able to make the tools. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all these things are balanced out in terms of how many babies are born with one trait versus another and live to reproduce themselves that have these characteristics. So in, in a way, we can understand why babies can't cling. We're the only primate that can't cling at birth. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with the immature state of the prefrontal cortex and the motor, what's called the motor cortex of the brain. And as you see, see some of the behaviors that non-human primates exhibit um, are delayed because of the advantages, but yet the limitations of the human pelvis, the architectural arrangement uh, that frees the hands to mm -hmm. do all these other important manipulations of the environment, one of which is to, to make things, to help our bodies do what we couldn't otherwise do. So that's a really, and the other thing that's fascinating you might find interesting as others have, our babies are born with <clears throat> appropriate subcutaneous fat, about nine to 12%, non-human primate baby. And it has nothing to do with the, the um, obesity increases due to bad mm -hmm. diets. Um, it has to do with the ability of mothers to milk let down how long it might take and also as an insulation to babies that will be in various kinds of um, diverse environments that non-human primates don't live in and some unknown factors as to why they are born with, with that and non-human primate babies are not. Mm -hmm. It might be to make babies more attractive really in terms of their survivorship because mothers throughout all prehistory and history have had to make decisions about when they're having their babies, will that baby survive in a sense and make it worth carrying that baby. There are many cultures for which, you know, babies, at least in the past, you know, that didn't look like they would be survived were in fact mm -hmm. left to die or so in some mm -hmm. kind of form because maternal resources are limited. And, you know, it's the sad fact that, you know, there are conditions that make it more likely and more favorable for women to reproduce. And this has always been with us throughout history and prehistory as it is now. Um, so resources aren't equal. And that's a, a sad fact. That yeah. And thus, the timing of baby's births, you know, can be positive or negative leading to decisions mothers have to make about their baby's survival. It's rare now, but um, certainly it's been true throughout, you know, 32,000 years ago or yeah. you know, you know, 100,000 even. And I like more recently too. I like but, the idea of thinking about um, babies as kangaroo joeys. Yeah, yeah. That, that really, that they complete their gestation essentially after birth. That's exactly right. I mean, yeah. there, you probably know, or somebody knows anyway, the three types of mammals are the placentals like us, the monotremes that are kind of in between. They're, they don't have breasts. They just leak milk through their pores and their babies are hatched in eggs and suck up the milk their mothers are leaking. Um, so there's the placental, the monot monotremes, and the, uh, the joeys. They, they can't grow, and I'm blanking right now on the third <laughs> type of mammal. But That's fine. Maybe they, you're right that they, it is a really interestingly transitionary type of mammalian uh, evolution. Yeah. And so could we, um, yeah, could we talk a bit about the ways in which a baby's body is limited and depends on the mother and the ways in which breast sleeping helps them develop, in fact? Right. Uh, so, for example, um, the importance of touch. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Touch is compared to medicine. It's none of us can develop normally without affection and touching. It still is true in middle age and adulthood. You know, one reason why perhaps uh, widows or widowers that live alone die earlier is because they don't get the emotional support that's so required in, for babies, for sure, where their systems actually learn from the engagements that are provided by their mothers. Plus, the heat and the smells elicit changes in those babies' bodies that and, and buffer 
the mm -hmm. baby from the elements in the environment that its own body isn't prepared yet to uh, contend with. Warmth being one of them, thermal regulation. When they Babies can't shiver to, you know, or thermoregulate. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's not mature yet. Their breathing's mm -hmm. not mature yet. Touching can stimulate breathing. Um, yes, and that's something that's an issue in their sleep, right? Because babies actually, that's actually a theory for why SIDS occurs, is that they are somehow still figuring out or developing the part of their body that can transition between sleep um, Sleep breathing. Yes, that's right. And it's my own theory. One of the causes of sudden infant death syndrome deals with the process by which the volitional, voluntary part of breath that's required for speech eventually, as we, I'm doing now, you're doing something very different. Your tidal breathing and your autonomic system is taking care of you, the brain okay. stem, the primitive part of the brain. Mm. When I talk, I am purposely taking a breath, how much air to get to the end of my sentence so I don't mm -hmm. have to talk like this, you know, yeah. I mean... I'm not breathing when relationship to my breath. That's all learned by babies. Right. And they learn it through crying. But as their brain matures, they can control the volume, the pitch, and the type of cry <clears throat> that's motivating. Mm -hmm. And that's called speech breathing. Mm -hmm. And that has a neurological basis. At first, for about a month, the brainstem controls breath. And, in we, and even the baby's responding to normative apneas, the autonomic system will, will take care of it for the baby. But starting at around one or two months, the integration of the higher cortex thinking part of your brain where you gain control of reaching and thinking about what, thinking about what you will do, want to do, and can control that integration of more reflexive behaviors, with some of which, many of which disappear, are replaced by behaviors that are learned. Mm -hmm. And one of them is, in fact, how to stop apneas. The first month, babies reflexively respond to the apneas with the primitive breathing control system dealing with it. But at or around two to four months, when babies are at the most risk for SIDS, it really requires a volitional act, a voluntary act in sleep when babies are in REM, which is one space, a neurological activity in which these asynchronous lack of development between the old breathing control system, the autonomic one, and the new one, the neocortex, the higher brain executive functioning systems will take control of. So to get back to my point, at the time that the baby's transitioning to an integrated system of the old, new, or volitional versus non-volitional, autonomic. The baton could be passed as babies move from REM sleep, as one example. They move into it, it could occur, but when they're moving out of it, because when babies are dreaming, assuming it's the same as it is for us adults in this one regard, when you are in rapid eye movement sleep, you, you kind of jump in and out of breathing irregularly. You actually believe more, breathe more erratically, but there, your purposeful expansion of your lungs actually brings in more oxygen. So babies are generally more oxygenated. Oxygenated. Oxygenated, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Oxygenated. And so it's interesting, but it's irregular, a little more, you know, periodic, the breathing. And it's like the babies watching what they're dreaming about just like you and I it's content specific where those little eyes in REM sleep are moving back and forth um, but in any event I'm saying and hypothesized and you could say a speculation that mm -hmm. one of the the unique reasons why human babies are susceptible to some kind of breathing control error during sleep is the potentially asynchronous emergence of the volitional with the non volitional. And so when babies are done with their REM and going into a stage one or two or whatever it might be, that the baton is missed, the, the neuronal signal, the, the, dend the dendrite doesn't pick up, you know, the, uh, the spark, so to speak, the electrical connection of mm -hmm. one system to the other. And I've actually argued that there's, that the same system can 
be used to potentially explain colic or inconsolable crying. Mm -hmm. That a baby might be able to, uh, we know that inhibitory neurons in the prefrontal cortex um, develop after or are moved from uh, one space to the prefrontal cortex right, that gives the ability to stop activities mm -hmm. is developing after excitatory neurons mm. are in place in these areas. And they, they balance the two excitatory with inhibitory. So I'm uh, thinking with recent research by Paradis showing the migration of 80% of the neurons going to the prefrontal cortex are inhibitory that it may be the case that before that, babies can initiate a cry, but they have no capacity to stop it at, mm -hmm. in, during this transitionary period. For some babies, it's just a little imbalance. And um, in noticing it, the babies get afraid and are fearful, and they do more of what they're trying to stop, which is to cry in fear. Mm -hmm. And that's just a, a, an idea or that can be tested in terms of what type of neurons babies have. I know it's, it's, uh, would, it's tricky research, but it can be tested to see. Anyway, yeah. so I'm if just- If there are researchers see. listening, yeah. That's something that could be researched. Yeah, yeah. 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 and I published, we published a paper on this idea too. So I'm excited that I, in my lifetime, will obviously be able to um, research this, but I'm actually speaking with neurobiologists now about the possibility of them doing so. So mm -hmm. I'm very excited about that. And they're very excited about this very new thinking about yeah. inconsolable crying, which has never moved beyond <laughs> the sort of typical explanations for 60 years, you know, since it was defined, you know, as a colic or yeah. colicky babies. One of the things you hear here, so, in, I'm in Paris, is uh, the discouragement right. from responding to your baby's cry because they have to exercise their lungs. Yes, so it's actually good crazy. that they're crying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, I think, delusional. I mean, pardon me if you will think it and are listening, but it's not the fact. It probably is a way of justifying letting these little yeah. babies cry out. And I have to say I have strong personal opinions on that uh, yeah. because the only 10 minutes in my life I wish I could take back was when I, like everybody, many people thought, oh, it's, maybe I better let my baby cry it out. This was before I went into this specific research mm. and couldn't stand it myself and opened the door, came in and saw this sobbing, beautiful, little loving baby of mine and saw the love in his eyes for me who was torturing him. And I'll, I'll never forget it. It sounds ridiculous but still that was 10 minutes or maybe it was 15 that yeah if there was one thing i could take back it would be that because it was utterly unnecessary it yeah well if that's the worst social, parenting social, story social instruction has nothing to do with <laughs> if that's the worst I parenting know, story you still, have. <laughs> it, um, it, i still remember his face and yeah the, the love that was all about the love he had for his parents Mm. his need for them that was right and there was um something you mentioned in the book too is the levels of cortisol when you are doing cry it out um which i also tried and it was i, I we couldn't follow through with it um the when you are doing that the levels of cortisol go up in the caregiver because it's difficult to hear the baby crying and to not go respond to them yeah and in the baby. And then once the baby stops crying a few days later or however long it takes, um, the mother or caretaker's cortisol goes down because they think that everything's okay. But then in the saliva samples of the babies that were in the research, their cortisols were still high, even though they weren't. Is that correct? Is that Yes. Yeah. That's okay. correct. Very good. Very Our good. internet is, is very point. poor. Wendy, once you might. Yeah. Well, um, I just wanted to say that that's Wendy Middlemas, Middlemas oh. research, and we have that cited in, in the book, that that was a really interesting project she did, that the baby's cortisol did not return. And, and who knows whether it eventually did, mm -hmm. but certainly yeah. the time period of the research, the baby's cortisol was still high, mm -hmm. whereas, and don't forget, I thinking that we could assume that the baby then is this, quote, sleep trained, 
right. um, and is sleeping in an environment for which its body and mind are not uh, designed. Yeah. So it would be expectable that the babies that do not have the contact with the mother's body or father's body, you know, would, would be higher because it, they're in a life-threatening situation. Um, and going back to the idea of what's going on with the sleep and oxygenation, uh, there's the notion of the good baby. And that is something that it is the number one thing you get asked in Paris, France. And I've only had a baby here. I haven't, even though I'm American, I didn't have my baby in the States. And so I, I think that it's really a thing here. I don't know if Americans get asked this as much, um, but that when you meet other parents or when you're meeting anyone and they're interested in your baby, the first thing that they will ask you is, is your baby sleeping through the night? Because yeah. then if you, say, if you say yes, then you're successful. Uh, mm-hmm. And so then you've got a good baby. Um, and actually, when you look at what you've written, it, the good baby, well, well, let's not put babies in terms of good and bad. Um, right. But when you, what you've written in the book is that actually um, because the baby, yeah. of the problem with breathing and needing oxygen, it's actually good to be waking up throughout the night. They need these arousals, right? That is exa- that's exactly right. And I think what's happened is once medical people or representing a medical position thought that it's good for babies to sleep through the night and consolidate their sleep as young as possible, um, there was a gradual historical transformation from um, if it's good for babies to do th- do so, isn't it a small step away from concluding that good babies do so? Right. And so that it, it's this conflation of a moral judgment with what was perceived to be a medical good or a developmental good kind of became one and the same. So yeah. So that, that's a universal amongst many of our societies, this horrible ex- question does your baby sleep through the night that became equated with some moral caricature of the baby. Mm -hmm. And it's totally ridiculous. It's based on a a misunderstanding. This whole notion of it's good for babies to sleep through the night and therefore they're good is a complete misrepresentation um, of what is in fact really good for babies. And that is to protest when their lives are threatened Mm -hmm. or when their genes speak and there's something wrong, which mm-hmm. one thing that would be wrong would be the absence of the other, of the mm-hmm. mother, et cetera. So in many ways, you could argue if you need to, the good baby is the most vigorously adapted baby, the one that's more likely to survive. And guess who that would be? It's the baby protesting what amounts to a life-threatening situation to it. Mm-hmm. That's a baby in crisis, the baby without a body, it engaging physically with it um, is in fact a baby in crisis. This is an expression that my colleague and friend Niels Bergman from South Africa uses. And he, he was the one that originally talked about the mother's body as the habitat mm. of the baby, where the baby lives. And, and I added a little bit to it. The only environment to which the baby is in fact biologically able to respond and all its systems will do the same thing universally and heat up, um, become warm, warmer, uh, heart rate changes, hormonal profiles change, um, blood pressure changes, um, kidney function changes, digestive systems change. It is a, it's sort of the mother's body becomes the placenta. Mm -hmm. We all underestimate or never really think about the placenta. But the placenta is remarkable. It's, a, it's all six organs in one. It does wow. everything. The digestion, respiration, thermal regulation, um, excretory functions. It does everything. Kidneys, p- blood pressure wow. of the baby, everything. It's not very attractive, but the placenta is everything. And then when the baby is born, our baby's being born so you know, neurologically immature, the, the mother's body becomes, the external body becomes the womb mm-hmm. and, and the continuation of it. And the, and the, the new umbilical cord is mother's breast, delivering immunobodies to the baby, um, home-designed immunobodies as well, and nutrients to the baby. But not just that. 
skin contact, touch, and movement, and vestibular stimulation, and breath, and smells. Mm -hmm. You think of, in my uh, presentations of my work, I show this beautiful little baby with his hands on his mother's face, facing the mother, sleeping very close to the mother, and the mother's face within two inches of the baby's. And I ask the audience, tell me what's going on here. And the first reaction is, oh, wow, what a peaceful, beautiful picture. And it really is. Not clear. I said, no, but let me tell you, let me just use the term, this is an amazing, almost violent engagement all together. There's air passing, carbon dioxide passing. There's pancian cells of the baby's cheeks feeling the breath. The baby's taking in the breath. The CO2 is stimulating the phrenic nerve to breathe. The mother's chest rising and falling. So the baby's detecting this. The brain is responding to it. If the, the, the mother, the baby hears the mother's vesicular sounds. So, and so you get not just the touch of the breath on the cheek and the CO2 coming, but the auditory stimulation to the baby. Constant little reminders to keep that breathing going, that breathing going. Mother's smells from her breast milk production is in fact all around the baby. The baby's smelling that mother's milk. And that's why the babies upon birth can actually recognize their own mother's milk. And from they can the recognize their own mother's milk. Too. Yeah. Um, we don't know that yet. Right. And yeah. so when you think of this beautiful, and that baby's little, when you see the picture, the baby's fist is gently against the, the mother's cheek. And the stimulation of these underneath pantsian cells are going to the brain. So the brain is running. This Talk about Einstein. You don't need any of those Einstein toys or this or that. All you need for everything, intellectually, cognitively, and its development, as well as the, the actual oxygenation and the the, the nutrients of the breast milk with the breastfeeding delivery. It's a, it's a, the reason I coined that term breast sleeping as one word is because it's a singular system, biocultural mm -hmm. system where all of the variables involved are not explicable without reference to those other variables. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know maternal infant sleep or maternal sleep, if you want to know infant sleep, if you want to know how many breastfeeds per night, you want to know mother's volume of milk production, you want to know mother's cortisol levels or baby's cortisol levels, none of those variables are explicable without the other being considered in relationship to it. Mm -hmm. And especially these neurologically immature little babies of ours. Yeah. And so, another thing uh, was that the length of time between um, an infant's need to feed is equivalent to a mother's sleep cycle. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the interesting findings. I realized we really were able to get all the breastfeeds through infrared taping and actually the physiological monitoring of the facial muscles of, of, that you typically have when you're studying sleep through polysomnography. Mm. I thought that was really fascinating. Yeah. There, one of the grouping of mothers was in fact almost right on the target 90 minutes, which was the average uh, between the feeds, the interval. Mm. And sometimes it can be more, sometimes it can be less, but I wondered, and it could be tested, whether in all mammal species, the sleep cycle is regulated by the needs of a undeveloped baby mm. that is breastfeeding. And I found it fascinating that for humans, it could be that what drove originally the, you know, the neurological mechanisms and structure and timing of, of the sleep cycle was in fact the needs for babies to be fed yeah. you know, regularly yeah. through the day and night. So you approached this work not as necessarily an American and what's normal for Americans. You were looking at human evolutionary history and world cultures in our current times. And, and can you tell us what you found in, in terms sure. of co-sleeping? Yeah. True. And this is not Jim McKenna's research. This is okay. my uh, colleagues around the world that okay. have written beautiful uh, ethnographic cultural studies of uh, infant care practices, et cetera. 
and we have some wonderful people. Alma Gottlieb is one of them who has contributed uh, just greatly to the cross-cultural data on mothers, babies. Carol Worthman, uh, another wonderful colleague that has contributed too. Mm. And anthropologists have a human areas relation file that all the cultures in the world on all their practices are all synthesized and summarized. So one can research these kinds of issues. But what is true is worldwide in non-industrialized societies, there never was any question pertaining to where babies would sleep or how they would feed or how you would lay baby for down to sleep because it was inevitable and the only way in which to keep a baby alive was to breastfeed. Mm -hmm. um, and the other half of breastfeeding is the mother having a mother right there to do it. <laughs> I mean, it seems yeah. so crazy. And even my, my colleagues sometimes forget the other half. We talk about the importance of breastfeeding, but mm -hmm. to maximize and optimize breastfeeding, you need to have mothers sleeping there next to the baby that can elicit in the normative context here, which is the mother baby sleeping right close together in on the same surface, whatever yeah. that might be. And so you, you get um, many more feeds and the interval does diminish and it does increase the possibility that the prolactin will prohibit the mother from coming into ovulation um, you know, soon or too soon before that other baby is weaned. Mm. And in, it is a complex factor. It's, there's not one singular factor that determines birth interval. It's mother's weight and her own ability to support a pregnancy, et cetera. Um, so, so fat uh, uh, deposits are, are really critical. Um, so lactational amenorrhea also is reflective of how many viruses or the virus load or the bacterial load that species that women confront in different environments. That energy has to go to the immune system as well as to making milk and other mm. maintenance activities of a mother, et cetera, of course. Um, but in any event. Um, and SIDS is something that I is, I'm not sure, I don't think I saw this in your book, but I saw it maybe in online forums. Um, people were saying in Asian cultures, we sleep with our babies and we never heard of SIDS. Um, right. And right. yeah, uh, so it's just interesting because it's so, um, it's so prevalent in, in our society. Um, it's just an accepted yeah. thing we live with. Yeah. Right. It, it's every culture tends to think what they do is not only normal but best, mm -hmm. and ethnocentric called ethnocentrism. Yeah. Um, and obviously, not everybody can have the best, or you know, certainly Western yeah. society has tried to import all of our behaviors. And I, I say with great dread that the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation against bed sharing has had a huge negative effect, as far as I'm concerned, yes. on other cultures trying to reduce them to this best system uh, which has yeah. actually been the system that produced sudden infant death syndrome in fact the cause of we don't know what the biologic cause of the syndrome is mm -hmm. necessarily specifically but we know that the conditions in which babies live can increase or decrease certainly the likelihood that it would take place and we did everything to promote what we have come to call sudden infant death syndrome by first taking away breast milk mm. and substituting substitutes of the various kinds, including formula, which is a risk factor for SIDS. It's a we formula is a risk factor for SIDS. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, we, and that data is very well demonstrated. Yeah. Secondly, we decided to follow this little, um, let's make a good baby put babies prone, they arouse less frequently, they sleep more deeply, which isn't in their favor because it's harder for babies to terminate apneas if they're spending huge amounts of time or larger times than normal in the deepest stages of sleep. That's when, like you or I as adults, it's harder to wake us up. We don't want to wake up. You know, you're, you wake up groggy because it's a very deep, you're less reactive to external events in the fourth mm -hmm. stage as it's called sleep. In our studies, we had to combine three, stage three and four uh, to get a better read on where, how the babies were sleeping because their system wasn't as well developed in the first year or so of life. The three cultural components we dismantled, mm -hmm. prone sleep, 
promoting deep sleep, uninterrupted sleep, not in a baby's interest at all. That's not what they're supposed to do. It's dangerous for them. And then the, the last one being the babies being shuttled off to sleep separately. Now we know babies sleeping in a different room by themselves is a major risk factor for sudden infant death syndrome. Mm. You have those three cultural components that created the SIDS epidemic in Western industrialized societies, which explains why in many Asian countries that co-sleeping in one form or another, diverse as it may be, breastfeeding in the context of no alcohol and no smoking um, actually is what can explain, at least we think, mm -hmm. uh, why sudden infant death syndrome in the level, at the levels that it is found is not found in cultures around the world for which the normative biology of infancy, breastfeeding, sleeping on the back, getting access to mom's breast tube right next, next to the baby um, is present there in terms of these, these populations. And many of us have sort of looked in the lexicons of different languages to see if there's something called sudden infant death syndrome or where the healthy baby goes to sleep and doesn't wake up. Yeah, it must be yeah. somewhere. Yeah, couldn't <laughs> find anything, none of us. Wow. In the human area relation files. Um, there, there was one thing that we found in one very uh, now extinct culture where they had a word for uh, the ghost that would come at night and steal a baby's heart. But oh. these were babies that were a little bit older than since they were older than one or two, that they could have been two years or three, where the, this, this uh, spirit would come and steal the babies. That was the closest we would come to finding a term, but these not for young babies. And interestingly, never ever in my whole anthropological career um, have I ever heard of suffocations as being a prominent, if at all, experienced in other cultures? Now, I can't, I can't imagine that it hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. um, but the point is that you never hear it to you. Yeah, that co-sleeping does lead to this suffocation, doesn't it? No. Um, and maybe it's not fair to quite make that comparison either because our sleeping arrangements are filled with um, accoutrements that, that never were there, you know, in terms of uh, a mother and baby sleeping, not on mattress, not pillows, not within the presence of drugs or alcohol, well, at least insofar as mothers are concerned. I think the drugs were there in, in other yeah. cultures and part of their ceremonies and rituals. So we're hearing your research uh, and then reconciling that with the information we hear from pediatricians. I, I told a friend of mine I was having this meeting with you and she said, well, what does he think of bed sharing? Because my pediatrician strongly advised against it. And so we have to reconcile that people are getting medical advice from trusted professionals um, and why in terms of how they arrive at their recommended guidelines, um, we need to understand how the medical field works because why, um, who is the AAP and what is their role in shaping our outlook on this? How come it's not being recommended? Yeah. Is that well, an easy all, question? I guess not. <laughs> not that I don't have incredible respect for pediatricians. Many yeah. of them are my friends, but it just makes me all together to be able to say that pediatricians quite willingly confess they're not experts on human development mm -hmm. they don't you know learn about the stages through which babies go their evolutionary histories how babies live cross-culturally so they simply are then they don't do research on sudden infant death syndrome the american yeah. academy of pediatrics is a very uh, great organization for the most part but on this area as far as i'm concerned and the researchers that have actually studied bed sharing directly. And most yeah. of the people making these recommendations have never looked at nor studied or published a paper on um, breastfeeding physiology, breastfeeding behavior, original research on what mothers think and what they do. So keep in mind, I think it's a great limitation that it's been medical authorities that have had the last word on how one should care for babies. Yes. Yeah. Pediatricians themselves, um, they just order or make these recommendations based on what somebody else is telling them. And that's a subgroup, uh, very insular, 10 to 15 people that have studied uh, expressions of SIDS, what it looks like, the physiology of it and, and such. Uh, no one's questioning the legitimacy of that, but the legitimacy 
of not incorporating when you're talking about behavior and care, those sciences that know much more about that and have been themselves involved in research on these areas. Mm -hmm. And the mo all of the recommendations are coming from about six or seven epidemiological studies, which are wide population wide studies where questionnaires are, are given. We, we look at the characteristics of the babies that died in their environmental circumstances. And we then, as a comparative group, we look at the babies that, um, in this sense, um, bed shared or didn't bed share. Mm -hmm. And the, the risk factors are determined by, of the number of babies that bed share, as reported by parents, how many lived, in a sense. And then in terms of uh, the other issue is the numbers of babies that were not bed sharing that lived. So that ratio is important. The problem from that research is that so many variables are not considered in that. Often, whether the mother was breastfeeding, mm -hmm. often whether she was informed or how much she knew about protective bed sharing behavior. Um, and also whether or not any drugs or alcohol were implicated in the death of the baby. Sometimes not knowing if the baby actually from SIDS, but in the bed, if the baby's caught sleeping prone, the cause of the death is said to be bed sharing with the solution eradicating bed sharing. So there's a like a double standard that's being employed by babies dying in cribs versus babies dying in, mm -hmm. in the beds. So, yeah. um, and it, it, it sounds very divided. Um, in oh, I know back yeah. to that issue of the, yeah. So what you have is the American Academy, a very trusted group, um, and very smart people, but I feel that they have not incorporated what, what is one of the most important principles of evidence-based medicine. Mm -hmm. And that is to regard as being very critical what the patient, in this case, the mother, thinks and needs and wants to do. That's a, a major principle. Secondly, never to move from epidemiological findings that you do have variables and questions that weren't asked that should have been, to move to direct sweeping public health recommendations before testing hypotheses as to why pockets of findings in that epidemiological research, what explains it? And that's incredibly important for bed sharing because there are some people that bed share and their babies live um, because of the conditions within which they're doing it, like mm. the breast sleeping context. Mm -hmm. um, and then there, the same behavior can be and does lead to death when done unsafely. And that would have been more easily uh, dramatized if the data that said that bed sharing was a risk uh, was looked at further in the yeah. populations that all together were, were lumped to make the general recommendation against any and all bed sharing. So it's not that people are well, not well intended, but I critique them because they have failed to follow the rules of evidence-based medicine, which is to try to seek consensus they have not in terms of incorporating people like myself and Helen Ball and Sally Boddock, Janine Young, who have actually studied the phenomenon they're making recommendations on. Mm. In fact, if anything, I have been totally purposely excluded. And you know, I, I think all my papers and scientific research is being published in the very same journals that they're publishing their yeah. papers in. So this is not just a wild fringe idea. This is science. This is yeah. human biology. And those arguments are powerful. Uh, they're made not just by me alone. The evidence is there in all yeah. kinds of lines of research. And one of the arguments that you make is that despite recommendations against bed sharing, mothers are doing it anyway. Yes. Because of their instincts, because also we didn't even speak about how tired moms are. That was really one of my reasons for doing it. Um, right. And so it is happening, even in there is a study that you mentioned where the moms are not telling the truth to their healthcare providers for shame of breaking the rules or doing something wrong. So there's, there's a lack of transparency between mothers and healthcare providers because uh, there's 
there's not an acceptance of reality, really, uh, that this is happening. And your argument is that since this is the case, that we would all be better off if we acknowledged that this is happening and we gave safety guidelines around it. Yes. Yeah. And not to stigmatize parents. Um, I could see that happening and then a, a group of people still thinking, well, this is bad behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're just fixed on that notion. And, and that's fine. I think we all need to move beyond the American Academy of Pediatric as a final word. There mm-hmm. is, for example, the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine composed of just as smart people, just as knowledgeable people um, as any anywhere you would find in our mm-hmm. world research and interest. They're experts on breastfeeding and indirectly have become experts on SIDS. Well, not research experts, but nonetheless, they know it. And a new protocol was just published. I think the date is 2020 rather than 2019. It was December or so where it came out and um, finally reached the journal, I think in January or so. Anyway, that actually uh, recommends against a harm reduction approach not to critique or uh, criticize parents for bed sharing, to give them all the support based on their decision. And of course, whether or not it is a safe form of bed sharing. And there's a whole group of little questions we recommend could be asked to ascertain Mm. whether this would be a safe uh, bed sharing, breast sleeping situation or not. Yeah. So again, it's not like saying everybody should breast, uh, you know, breast sleep, but with certain uh, qualifications, given the environmental realities, that need to be considered. It would be very helpful for millions of mothers in our country and around the world that know that there's a theoretical perspective that is in disagreement with sleeping with your baby. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, the power of the biology and the legitimacy as it's emerged from studies of human babies and mothers sleeping together and huge numbers of other related research that is discarded or not considered or dismissed by that recommendation and the people that make it. And I don't fault anyone for having disagreements in interpretation of data. That's how science grows and gets better and gets closer to the truth. But the very fact, for example, and I hate using myself as an example, but not, there's not that many people that have actually studied bed sharing. So everybody counts in this way. And I created this, the science of the bed sharing. With our first studies shown, really shows you how powerful culture is. The very first studies coming from an anthropology where we're looking at how babies really do sleep, which mm-hmm. is with their mothers breastfeeding through the night. And that came out of a very different body of research, which indicates how important that other body of research is to getting these recommendations right. Mm -hmm. And the very fact that we know that this is true, that most breastfeeding mothers are sleeping with their babies, should give those people making those simplistic recommendations pause to think, why? Well, the answer to the question is because they're supposed to. Yeah. Mothers are supposed to sleep. Isn't it? It's astonishing. Yeah. It's astonishing the removal of the mother. Um, but that could be a whole other um, hour conversation. <laughs> um, right. But yeah. The and that, are value added. Yes. The value of the relationship, the value of connection, um, the long term psychological benefits. Um, And yeah, I think that one thing in your book you say is that the relationship doesn't just stop abruptly when nighttime comes. The relationship continues during the night. And so, yeah, I just, I always, I always wonder what these small decisions do in the long term, not just to the individual, but on the larger scale of society when we're talking about brain development, when we're talking about lack of connection and things like that. So I just hope that everybody is able to have the relationship with their baby that they want and they feel that they've, they've got a happy baby and uh, And a healthy baby. Yeah. Happy and healthy. That's what the book is basically all about. Uh, Yeah. Lindsay, I know I'll be a success when there is no need for a Jim McKenna or someone like me studying this phenomenon. I feel my career has been documenting the obvious um, and it has been, it has <laughs> but been, thank you, you for know, doing it. 
and actually one of them, a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics is one of the main people who recommend this book. Yeah. Uh, yes. Which is oh, ironic. Oh, I don't, I don't want you to think that they, all the <laughs> medical profession art thinks, oh my God, Jim McKenna is a horrible person, you know, sporting this. Sometimes I feel that's the way, but oh, many, many physicians, the AAP has been trying to convince by holding conferences of the important lactation uh, people, uh, lactation support, scientists, et cetera, mm -hmm. trying to get them to say that the safest way for a baby to sleep is, you know, in a crib next to the bed yeah. and they won't do it. And I would never do it because mm -hmm. it isn't, it's, it's really inestimable mm -hmm. how mothers can make in many ways, a dangerous situation safe by that president. Uh, the horrible, unethical, uh, message that is being delivered to mothers is their bodies are no more than potential lethal weapons over mm -hmm. which neither they nor their babies have any control. Mm -hmm. That is untrue. That is unacceptable. Um, and to, to, even without directly saying it, to imply that an actual risk factor is the mother's presence without first stipulating the conditions within which that could be true. Mm -hmm but is not inherently true. Yeah. I feel is, you know, irresponsible. The same way that they are saying that, I mean, maybe without saying that mothers that quote, decide to sleep with their babies on the same surface are acting in a irresponsible way. That's just not. Or in a needy way, right? Yeah. We are the needy parent if we want to soothe our baby. Yes. Well, yeah. Lizzie, one of the things you might have taken from the book too, and I always I worried about it because I say it so many times. But one for parents, I know it takes some courage to say, "Thank you, Doctor Smith. I'm sleeping with my baby. I'm very happy to be doing it. I'm informed about it. I know what the controversy is, and I don't agree with the interpretation being given." by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And I know that's not your research, that you're obligated in terms of standard care issues to, to say this, I appreciate mm -hmm. that. But you know, you could even in, invoke me or say, you know, Dr. McKenna argues that mothers need to be telling and discussing this with pediatricians as much to inform you as, uh, in, uh, as also to get whatever they can offer in terms of even increased safety while bed sharing because the recommendation has failed. Uh, it, it will ever work because there are significant voices, my own being one of them, but there's a lot of other people that are scientifically arguing and justifying and protecting what amounts to one of the most precious and important bonds a human can experience and a particular form by which that bond is respected and it promoted and enhanced. Mm -hmm. And that is by taking all the good things we do for babies during the day and apply those same principles for them to function optimally at night. Babies can't understand why from six to six in the day, all these things we approve of, tactile contact, responsivity, um, affirmation, engagement are off limits. Mm -hmm. No wonder babies are confused about attachment issues. Yeah. When their attachment figure doesn't have, at least in some societies, uh, the ability or in uh, ostensibly um, for the benefit of that baby not to be able to carry forth and bring the same relationship they have with that baby during the day into the bed, which of yeah. course they would do. Yeah. And so parents can say that in order to further progress on this issue. That's yes. what parents can do. That's the action parents are and, recommended uh, to and take. Say, there is a very different story here, scientific mm -hmm. story. 